Thank you for the introduction, Marta. Um, so I would like, what I'd like to do today in these two hours is to give you an introduction to embedded contact homology. So here's a plan. It's a little ambitious, so I'm not sure that I'll finish. Um, but we can continue a little bit in the afternoon informally if we, if we don't finish uh, in two hours. Um, so I'll start with some applications so you can see why embedded contact homology is nice and what some of the things you can do with it. And then I will talk about uh, sort of holomorphic curves and symplectizations, which um, Joe talked a little bit about already on Tuesday um, afternoon. And then Gonzalo talked a little bit about on Wednesday morning. But I want to review some things that will be important. And then we'll define ECH, uh, which will take some time. And then I'll explain some examples. And then <coughs> I'll define the ECH spectral invariance and capacities, which are kind of the source, one of the main applications of some of the main applications of ECH. And then if we have time at the end, I'll get into some of the technicalities uh, for the definition of ECH. Um, OK. So let's start with the first um, set of applications. I'll just mention them quickly, because I think some of you have already heard me talk about uh, this kind of stuff a lot. So, so the first application. Um, is on symplectic embeddings. So as I'm sure, um, well, I think many of you have heard, Hutchings, using ECH, defined a sequence of capacities. So, uh, so for a format, for a form, dimensional symplectic manifold, he defined a sequence of numbers. So CK, these are all non-negative real numbers uh, that satisfy the following properties. Um, so these are, this is an increasing or non-decreasing function. So the first one, a non-decreasing sequence. So the first one is always 0, or the 0th one is 0. And then they get bigger or they don't get smaller. And you know they, they could even, at some point, be infinite. Um, I guess the most important thing is that they are symplectic capacity. So CK is a symplectic capacity, which basically means that it's a two-dimensional invariant. So it scales with the symplectic form. So it means that it has two properties. Uh, so CK of if I multiply my symplectic form by a positive number, this number gets multiplied by the same. So this is true for every positive a. And the second property is that it, obstru it obstructs symplectic embeddings. So if one manifold embeds into another symplectically, then this number on the left is going to be less than or equal to the number on the right. So if x1, omega1, symplectically embeds into x2 omega 2, then ck of x1 omega 1 is less than or equal to ck of x2 omega 2. OK? Sorry that the handwriting got a little small. Um, but I think you know uh, what's written. OK. Uh, another property is that we can compute it in some sp specific cases. And if I have time at the end, um, well, I, I, might, I might actually do the calculation for you. But uh, of course, I need a definition first. But I'll just tell you that if you consider an ellipsoid, which is a pretty natural uh, set in R4, so consider the, the set of z1, z2, and c2, such that pi times the norm of z1 squared over a plus the norm of z2 squared over b is less than or equal to 1. And you consider the standard symplectic structure in R4, so the sum of dx i dyi. Um, so when you restrict that to the ellipsoid that you know, makes the ellipsoid a symplectic manifold with boundary, then the uh, ECH capacities of these guys, well, this is a sequence of numbers. And I'm going to tell you what the whole sequence is. So this is just the set, or the multi-set, I should say, MA plus NB, where M and N 
are natural numbers, here including 0. So you take all the linear combinations of a and b, um, where m and n are, are natural numbers, and you put them in increasing order. And then you get all these numbers. OK, so for example, if you take uh, e11, so that's the ball. Like, what are these numbers for e11? So the first one is always 0, or the 0th one is always 0. And then I have to look at all the linear combinations of 1 and 1. OK, so I have 1, but I actually have two different ways of getting 1. So this is like a multi-set, in the sense that it's a set with repetitions. OK, so like I, I, can, I can have 1 in two different ways. So I can have 1 times 1 plus 0 times 1, or 0 times 1 plus 1 times 1. OK, and I can have 2 uh, three in three different ways. I can have three in four different ways, and so on. So this is C0, this is C1, C2, C3, C4, etc. Okay, so this is how I, I build my sequence. Okay. Uh, another example is, um, I mean, I, I guess we can do E12, just so you can see how the combinatorics goes. So for e12, we do the same thing. So we start. We always start with zero. Then the next one uh, is one. But notice that I only have one way to get one now. Uh, now, but two, I can get two in two different ways. Uh, I can get two times one, or just one times two. And for three, I also have only two different ways. But now for four, I have three different ways. So you know, it's just some combinatorics. So you can find the sequence. OK? So I, I told you this. And one of, I mean, there I, I could give a whole talk on symplectic embeddings, which I have done before here. So I won't do that. Uh, I'll just say one theorem um, so you can see the power of these numbers. So I'll just mention the theorem by Dusa Macduff from 2009. Uh, which says that an ellipsoid, a four-dimensional ellipsoid, a in e, a b, embeds into E C D if and only if these numbers C K of E A B are less than or equal to the number C K of E C D for every K. Okay? So if you believe that these things are well defined and exist the way I explained them, then one direction is obvious from this part here. And you know, you can, you can think of the theorem as being the opposite direction. So if ECH capacities do not provide an obstruction for the embedding, then the embedding exists. Okay, so sorry, this is a uh, symplectic. Always. Okay? Yeah? Uh huh. So it's, it's an abstract definition of just it's, it's a list of axioms of what these things need to satisfy. No, it's not a list of axioms. It's it's a it's an explicit construction. These are properties, not axioms. It's a procedure to obtain these numbers with these properties. Yeah. Okay. And it's a calculation that these numbers are this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. This is not an axiom. I could. could, yeah. You can. I mean, you first define it for level domains, but then you can. You can kind of. There is a brute force way to, to extend capacities to anything, uh -huh. which is basically you know, take the supremum of the capacity of the things that embed into it, and that's going to be a capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the first application. Yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, it's it, the the the. the um, I should say, you know, if a, if x is unbounded, then it could definitely be infinite. If x is a bounded subset of of R two n, uh, then it'll fit into a ball, and then it'll be finite. If x is a closed manifold, then I'm not sure. Like, I think, I don't know if it's possible to have a finite volume manifold with a closed capacity, but, huh? Um, well, 
I guess you could put that. I mean, I'm, I'm not like th saying that these are um, con like these are axioms for the capacitor. I'm saying these are properties. So I mean, it is true that the ball. I guess, yeah. I, I guess maybe you could say oh, I, I I only want to look at symplectic capacities, which are not trivial in the sense that some people do that. Say, well, I want these two properties, and I also want the ball to have positive capacity and the cylinder to have non-infinite to have finite capacity, which is true for these. Yeah. Sure, uh, uh, but I don't. I don't want to. I don't need to reprove Gromov's non-squeezing. And um, but yeah, maybe, maybe I'll add this. So the third condition, which is very common in the literature, is that uh, this capacity is not trivial in the sense that uh, the capacity of the ball uh, is positive, uh, ball of say radius one, uh, and this is less than or equal to the capacity of what's called the cylinder. I don't really want to talk about Grom Momsen squeezing now, but and we want this to be less than infinite. OK. Oh, this is true for ACH capacities. OK. So this is one set of applications. Uh, and then there's a lot more that, want, that can be said about ECH and symplectic embeddings. But let me move on to the second um, set of applications, which is in Rabe dynamics. And it's really here that, like, this is where the motivation started. I think ECH capacities was more, more like an accident. Uh, and where, you know, I think this is kind of Hutchings' original idea at first. And the capacity is like a bonus um, that he discovered uh, in 2009. So um, let me recall um, the problem that um, David mentioned a little on, on Monday and Joe mentioned also on Tuesday. So say we have a three-dimensional uh, manifold, which is closed and oriented. And sometimes you know, we want to assume it's connected, but that's less important. Um, and le let's choose a contact form. Let's fix a contact form on it. Um, and recall that when you have a contact form, that gives rise to a ray vector field or it gives rise to a vector field called the Rabe vector field, which is the unique vector field uh, such that, which is in the kernel of the lambda. Uh, so this defines a vector field up to scaling. There's only um, one direction that is in the kernel of the lambda, and with the additional property, the normalization property, that lambda of r equals 1. OK? So you know, this, is, this defines a dynamics uh, on your manifold. And you can ask very simple questions like, does, this, does the flow of this vector field have a closed orbit? So you know, this is the first question. Does uh, R have an or a closed orbit? And as Joe explained on Tuesday, this was kind of the motivating question for people to define, to try to define contact homology in general. So, and this is called the Weinstein conjecture for a general contact manifold. So, the Weinstein conjecture is that for. Uh, on 2n minus 1 manifold and lambda contact form, uh, the answer is yes. The answer is positive. Okay? So, I mean, if you ask a generalized question in any dimension for any contact form, the answer is positive. This is still open. But the answer to this question here in dimension 3 is actually yes. So, I guess the first theorem that I want to tell you about is a theorem by Taubes from 2007, where he says that the answer is positive. Uh, Weinstein conjecture holds in dimension 3. OK? So uh, he proved that, yes, there is always a closed ray orbit with no assumptions on the manifold. 
And this was you know, extremely important. And it doesn't exactly use ECH, but it uses a lot of the ideas from ECH. Uh, and I mean, it, basically, it uses Cyber-Witten theory, Cyber-Witten fluor theory, which he later proved that is isomorphic to ECH. So if you kind of cheat, let me tell you how to cheat and prove this theorem using ECH. So just to give you an idea of why this has, you know, is related to ECH. So I think you probably, you probably remember that the, this is, this is a cheat, so don't. It's not really the idea of the proof, but remember that Joe was saying, you know, the, the idea of, of uh, contact homology is the following. You want to show that there exists a closed Rabe orbit. So then the idea is to define a homology theory that's generated by Rabe orbits and show that it's not trivial. So if you want to show, so, so you define a homology theory generated by Rabe orbits and show it is not trivial. OK? So if you just you know, have this idea, I can tell you, well, ECH is some homology theory whose generators are Rabe orbits. I'll tell you what it is later, but it you know, doesn't matter. It's, there's something called ECH, which is generated by Rabe orbits. Um, so we just need to show this is not trivial to actually conclude the Weinstein conjecture. You see how you know, this is a good idea, but it's even hard to do in higher dimensions. I mean, it's hard to do in any dimension, but if it was easy, then we could prove the Weinstein conjecture. So, yeah, it is hard. So, in particular, defining ECH is hard. But, you know, Taub showed a little bit afterwards that this is actually isomorphic to another fluor theory, which is uh, called cyber written fluor theory, or monopole fluor theory. Uh, I'm going to just write it like this. And the point is that this guy is somewhat simpler than that guy, in the sense that this is, you know, this, this doesn't have a lot of the technical technicalities that this one has. I mean, it has other technicalities, it's gauge theory. Uh, but once you're in gauge theory, then this is, it's only, you know, 700 pages of Kromheim and Rovka, and everything is written there. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like Morse. It, this is actually kind of like Morse homology with not too many uh, problems. Whereas, you know, all the other ones, all the other fluor theories have more complications. Um, I should say. So this one, you know, if, if you, you know, just take the book from Kromerheim Rovka, read it all, you see that this thing is very well defined and it has great properties. In particular, it's infinitely generated, always. So in particular, it's non-trivial. So you know, that's, um, if you believe this, this isomorphism, then, then there you have it. Then you, have a, then, then you know that this guy is non-trivial. I should say one little comment for those who are paying attention to the details, which is that Maybe you want to say, oh, there's just one generator that's enough, but that's not enough. Because in ECH, an, a, you, can, you consider sets of Rabe orbits, and the empty set is a set. So it's actually a generator. So just showing this guy is not, is not zero is not really showing it's non-trivial. So you need to show that it has more than one generator. So anyway, but this is really cheating, because to prove this isomorphism, Taubes uses his first you know, Weinstein conjecture proof. So like part of the, 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 this isomorphism is to show that it's to construct Rabe orbits, which are generators of these guys, from monopoles, which are um, generators here. So you know, if you can construct one, then you already proved the Weinstein conjecture. You don't need anything else. So that's kind of um, the idea. Yeah. It doesn't depend on lambda at all. Well. Yeah, the, the, the homology to altogether doesn't depend on lambda at all. But that's a, that we, don't, we only know it because of this isomorphism, which is in kind of a, one of the weaknesses of ECH, is that we have to rely on this isomorphism for a lot of things. Okay, so it's not necessarily like it is a topological invariant. Like, unlike if you, if you do uh, contact homology, like Joe is telling us about, it depends on the context structure. I mean, it's not supposed to depend on lambda, but it's supposed to depend on the kernel of lambda. But ECH doesn't even depend on the kernel of lambda. It, it's like a topological, a smooth topological invariant. So, like, how often, like, is it, is it sort of hard to come up with in context when it maybe has three or more folded and then it's smaller than the kernel? And then to show that, uh, like, you have, like, an invariant of, of uh, squat. 
Yeah. I mean that's that's kind of that's kind of like the idea of some applications, but I mean other applications you actually really want the structure of lambda. Like for example, for capacities you want more than just the manifold, uh, so you can actually put extra structure on ECH. Uh, you know, it, 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 we'll see that later. Yeah. Okay. Any any questions? So let me tell you a few other refinements of the Weinstein conjecture that one can prove with ECH. So. Um, a little bit after Taub's proved this, um, a little bit after he proved this isomorphism, Hutchings and Taub's realized that they can do more than just the Weinstein conjecture. So theorem from Hutchings and Taub's, and this I think was around 2009. I don't know exactly when it was published, but they prove the Weinstein conjecture for what, what are called stable Hamiltonian structures, which are which is just generalization of contact forms. But in particular, they also proved something. They proved that for generic lambda, there exists at least two distinct simple Rabe orbits. Okay. By the way, let me just say this once and for all. When I say Rabe orbits, I always mean closed Rabe orbits. So that confuses some people. But uh, people in the field just call Rabe orbit a closed Rabe orbit. So. And by simple, I mean one that's not covered more than once. Joe was calling it embedded on Tuesday afternoon. So of course, when you have one Rabe orbit, you know, the, the vector field is autonomous. So if you have one closed orbit, you can just keep going, and you're going to have infinitely many. But those don't count you know, as, as you know, more than one in some way, in some sense. Okay? So what they proved is that using this isomorphism, that you, you have at least two distinct ones for a generic lambda. Yeah. Yeah, everything I'm going to say for the rest of the day is for dimension three. Yeah. There is no ECH in higher dimensions yet. <laughs> um, OK, so then a few years later, uh, using more machinery, um, Dan Christopher Gardner and Hutchings, uh, I think this was put on the archive in 2013, and I think it only got published in 2015 or 2016, I don't remember. So they proved that they dropped the genericity uh, assumption on lambda. So, um, for all lambda, there exists two Rabe orbits. OK? And then the last statement that I want to make was another, was a theorem that I thought was quite, you know, quite amazing, because I didn't know of that much dynamical systems before. But it's K. Irie also used symplectic uh, ECH capacities to show uh, a C infinity closing lemma. So he showed, well, not only you know, that there are two distinct simple Rabe orbits, but generically, there are a lot of Rabe orbits. So, almost, you know, so what he showed is that for generic, for lambda generic, uh, there is a Rabe orbit through almost every point. Or, in other words, there's a Rabe orbit through every neighborhood. Or, in other words, the union of the Rabe orbits is dense. Okay, so, in other words, the union of the Rabe orbits is dense. And then he went on to show some other things, but I think this is kind of uh, it's a pretty revolutionary idea to use ECH uh, to prove a result like this. Okay, any questions? Yeah, the main two is ECH. Yeah. OK. So let's uh, move on to some things about pseudo-holomorphic curves in some flexations. So I don't want to spend too much time on that. It's uh, slightly technical, or it's quite technical, but it's necessary. Um, so uh, 
Yeah, so before, let me just say a few things about uh, the rape flow. So say that we fix, so we fix a, a three manifold. Uh, we have a contact form. And we have the rape vector field. The first thing you, you can notice is that if you, it, let's call phi t the flow of the, of the rave vector field. So this is the flow of R. Our manifold is closed, so this flow is defined as a diffeomorphism for every t. Okay, so phi t is a diffeomorphism for every t. Okay? It's the flow of a vector field. And then you can see, uh, if you call c the kernel of lambda, which is usually known as the, simple, uh, as the context structure, we know that, we saw that d lambda is a symplectic structure on c. It's a linear symplectic structure on every c. So one observation, I think David might, I think he mentioned that, is that uh, that, that phi t, the delinearization of the flow, is a symplectomorphism. So this, or a symplectic linear map. So this takes Cp, d lambda, to you push forward uh, the structure, so you're going to have the context structure at a different point, uh, at phi t of p, uh, with d lambda. So this is a symplectic uh, map, symplectic linear. This is, a, is, is an easy calculation. So this is symplectic. Which means that if you have a gam if gamma is a ray orbit, of period capital T, then if you take phi t, you know, this takes any point to itself. So when you take uh, the push forward, it will be a symplectic uh, map, a symplectomorphism from xi p d lambda to itself. OK? So we can think of it as just a symplectic matrix. So uh, under some trivialization, this is just um, a symplectic matrix. Okay, so it's a two by two symplectic matrix, so it has a terminant one. Uh, so, like uh, I think Joe said, this, this there are two possibilities for the spectrum. Well, first of all, we could have one and minus one in the spectrum, and that's bad. So when that happens, we say that uh, it's a de de degenerate or orbit. So we say that um, gamma is degenerate if one is in the spectrum. OK? So this is the bad case. We're going to assume that this doesn't happen. So we're going to assume that lambda, uh, that there are no degenerate ray orbits. So we assume no degenerate ray orbits. OK? And it's a theorem that's not too hard to show that for generic lambda, this is true. So if you have a lambda that's degenerate, you perturb it a little bit, and then it'll stop being degenerate. All ray orbits will be non-degenerate. OK? So it also implies that there will be no ray orbits with minus 1 as an eigenvalue. Because if you took a cover, a double cover of that, then it would have, it would have 1 as an eigenvalue. So, um, so that means that um, there are only two possibilities for the spectrum. So, um, so the spectrum of the linearization of the flow, it's either um, lambda and lambda bar, where lambda is a unit complex number, which is not 1 or minus 1 inside C. Or you have r and 1 over r, where r is a real number, which is not minus 1, 1, or 0 inside C. OK, this is an easy linear algebra exercise that are 2 by 2 symplectic matrix. For a 2 by 2 symplectic matrix, the eigenvalues are in the unit disk and the real line. But if you require it to be non-degenerate, then you remove these points. OK, and as Joe told you about, uh, this, if this happens, you say the, or the rib orbit is elliptic. And if this happens, you say the rib orbit is hyperbolic. So the first situation, lambda and lambda bar, 
you say the gamma is elliptic, and r and 1 over r, you say the gamma is hyperbolic. OK? What? In what sense is it elliptic or hyperbolic? Like, you know, in like a symbolical phrase, what would be like, if I give a bunch of PDE or something like that? Like yeah, it, it's a different way. Like, it, it, it's, it's, it's not the elliptic PDE, but it's elliptic because sort of the flow is rotating. And it's hyperbolic. When it's hyperbolic, it means that basically it's contracting in one direction. There, there exists eigenvectors um, where in one direction it's contracting, and in the other direction it's expanding. I guess it's a more classical way of using the words elliptic and hyperbolic. Yeah. Uh, I have I think, I mean, the, the action functional here is just the integral of lambda over gamma. Yes. Yeah. No, I understand. I, I, I tried to do the computation in my head, but it did not follow. Ah. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm asking if it's some. It's, it's I think it is, yeah. I, I mean, I think you have to check the details and see in which space you're looking for rib orbits um, and it, what exactly you mean by the Hessian. Uh, but I think it probably, I mean, morally, it should be that. I mean, probably formally, if you write no, the, the Hessian, you could probably, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when you have a ray orb, you can always reparametrize. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, it's degenerate in that direction. Yeah. So there is an eigenvalue one in that direction. Yeah. OK. So if you're bored, uh, or you know, if you want to do some calculations, if you like calculations, here's an exercise. Um, that this, the space of symplectic matrices, 2 by 2 symplectic matrices, is diffeomorphic to S1 times R2. And inside the space, so if you use this isomorphism, which you, so you can get this by using um, the uh, PU decomposition, the uh, polar decomposition that Enrique told you about on, on Monday morning. So if you think about it a little bit, you can get this diffeomorphism. And then if you look inside here, there's actually a pretty uh, very nice picture, which is the, you can draw the following thing. So this is my R2. This is my S1. So here's the identity. Here is minus the identity. And then, well, let me use colors, actually. So you have something like this, something like this, and then this, and then this. And the blue set is the set of matrices that have 1 as an eigenvalue. And the pink set is the set of matrices that have minus 1 as an eigenvalue. So, so this is the set, the blue. I mean, the blue set is just a shell. It's not the interior. So this shell, uh, this is the set of matrices where the determinant of a minus i is equal to 0. The pink is the set of matrices where the determinant of a plus i equals 0. And notice the stores doesn't have the boundary because it's S1 times R2. And then, moreover, if you are inside this region, kind of like a banana, then you're elliptic. And if you're outside, you're hyperbolic. So if you're inside this region here, then you're elliptic. And then if you're outside, you're hyperbolic. So here, you are positive hyperbolic. And here, you are negative hyperbolic. OK? So uh, this could be a nice exercise for the students. 
if you want to, if you like calculations. But I think it's still a nice picture. In, in higher dimensions, the picture is not so pretty. But um, I, I like to remember this picture. Yeah. Yeah, like if, if this guy has uh, imaginary part positive or... Yeah. 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 Okay. So, I mean, it's exactly the projection to S1 here. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the last thing I want to say about Ray Borowitz before we talk about the actual simplexization is the Kohn-Zander index. So, Joe defined this, but let me just uh, say it one more time because I think it's a little bit of a hard thing to do at first. So, um, so you have to choose a trivialization of the context structure, which is the kernel of lambda, along your rape orbit. So the idea is we want to define some index. It's called the Alexander index for a rape orbit. So you choose a trivialization. Why is this trivializable? Well, this is a complex line bundle or a two-dimensional oriented real bundle over a one-dimensional thing. So that means it is trivializable. So this is just uh, isomorphic to gamma times R2. Okay. So you fix one trivialization. Now you can look at the path. You can look at um, the, the linearization of the flow. Under this trivialization is going to be a path of simplex matrices. So under this tau, the, 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 the linearization of the flow is a path of symplectic matrices. I'm going to call that path AT. And it starts with the identity, because the flow is the identity at t equals 0. So A0 is the identity. And at time capital T, it's going to be something that's, that's non-degenerate. Okay. So here it's going to be in what's called SP star of 2n. So SP star for me is just going to be uh, the set of matrices that are not uh, identity or minus identity. Okay. So the idea, you know, like if you now if you believe this picture, you have a path that starts from the identity and, I don't know, does something, and then it ends somewhere that's not on this, uh, on this blue cycle, actually. Okay? So this is called the Maslow cycle, the blue cycle. So the Kohn-Alexander index of this path of matrices, there are a few different ways to define it, but I guess the easiest one, if you have the picture, is, is somehow, it's more or less, the intersection of the path with this blue cycle. So this is, uh, you take the path and you intersect it with uh, the blue cycle. It's called the Maslow cycle. Okay. So, you know, if you know intersection theory, you should be slightly concerned because I, you know, this the path starts on the cycle. So it's a little tricky, but to make it formal, you actually have to first perturb it a, l a little bit away from the cycle, uh, and then you take the intersection. OK? OK, so that's what it is. So, uh, and then define the Kohn-Alexander index of the Rabe orbit relative to the trivialization tau to be this number. OK, so this is an integer. And what you can notice, it's, it's easy to see from the picture already, is that if you have an elliptic orbit, so if gamma is elliptic, then this number is always odd. Because I start here, and if I'm elliptic, I'm inside of these, banana, you know, of these bananas, so I have to intersect the blue guy either once, or three times, or five times, and so on. 
And if you're hyperbolic, if you're positive hyperbolic, then it's even. And if you're negative hyperbolic, then it's odd. Okay. So if it's positive hyperbolic, then this is even. And if it's negative hyperbolic, then this is odd. Okay. In general, we can write a little formula for it. Um, considering the rotation number, at least for the elliptic guy, there is a well-defined rotation number of the path. So if uh, gamma is elliptic, uh, it has a rotation number. So at first, you know, it's some number that's defined up to z. Uh, you know, how many times, you know, the, where where uh, the end is. But after you define the trivialization, it actually it it tells you exactly how many times uh, you've rotated to get to that guy. So I'm gonna just uh, not talk about the details of this, but it actually is a is a well-defined real number uh, after fixing. The trivialization. And using this, uh, the Conley Zander index of gamma is just twice the uh, floor of theta plus one. Okay, so if you, if, you, if you can see that, this formula follows directly from the picture, for example. Okay? Um, so if gamma is hyperbolic, then the Conley Zander index is either 2k or 2k plus 1. Okay, I'm not going to say anything more about hyperbolic orbits. But you can try to see more from the picture. Okay, any other questions? Oh, I should say one more thing, which is that if you're given a trivialization, you can act, there is an action of z on the set of, of trivializations, or on the isomorphism class of trivializations, which is just like as you go around gamma, you rotate your r2. So if you have a fixed trivialization, as you go around gamma, you could rotate with respect to this trivialization. So this is an action, this is the action of one. So this defines an action of z. Okay, so z acts on the set of trivializations. So if you actually, if you, it's, it's a co computation that what happens is if you act by a number n on your trivialization, all the Collins and their indices are going to be changed by a factor of minus 2n. Okay, so if you kind of move your trivialization like that, the pad of matrices kind of moves the other way. And you kind of have to compensate that by rotating around this uh, n times. So you intersect the blue guy two n times. Okay, so that's, that's what it is. Okay, so I've said a lot about three, -dimensional, three dimensions. Let's go to simplectizations. Any questions before I continue? Okay, so... Um, Remember that now, what we want to do, just like uh, in cylindrical contact homologies, we want to look at the symplectization. So we want to look at r times y with a symplectic form uh, d of e to the t. Uh, actually, I've been using t. So I'm going to call this uh, tau. Tau is my, my r coordinate. If I, if I write t at some point, please correct me. I might get confused. Huh? Oh, that's true. So s e to the s lambda. OK. So this is, uh, this is my symplectization. And I want to look at uh, j holomorphic curves in the symplectization. So I need to pick an almost complex structure. So, uh, so we choose or we fix a cylindrical, cylindrical almost complex structure, j, on the symplectization. Uh, which is compatible with uh, our symplectic structure. And cylindrical, as I think Joe mentioned, it just means that it's actually, oh, first, you know, we can choose a, a, an almost complex structure on the symplectic bundle, which is just the kernel of, uh, of lambda, so on the context structure. 
And then you extend it to the simplectization. By well, let me write this down. So cylindrical. Cylindrical means that uh, J uh, preserves C and is compatible with d lambda on C. So it's a linear algebra condition. So it's a compatible almost complex structure on the symplectic bundle. Uh, and then it also, d of DDS, j of DDS is the ray vector field. And j is s invariant. OK? So now what we want to do is we want to look at j holomorphic curves. U that go from a Riemann surface to uh, the simplectization. Okay. So a um, couple of comments is that there is no hope of looking at geoholomorphic curves that are closed because um, of Stokes' theorem, basically. Because of what Gonzalo said on Wednesday. You can't have a closed manifold uh, a, a closed j holomorphic curve here, because it's uh, zigzag. Okay. So anyway, it doesn't really matter. But we're only going to look at non-compact curves. One example is just a cylinder. So uh, an example, if you want to make sure you understand what's going on so far, is to maybe exercise. Show that if you take r times a Rabe orbit, where gamma is a Rabe orbit that this is a j holomorphic curve. Okay. So it's the same, you know, I'm looking at the image of the curve. So you often go back and forth between sort of the curve as a map and the image as a subset of the simplectization. Okay, so um, and being a j holomorphic curve, if the manifold is embedded, if the surface is embedded, that just means that it's a complex uh, almost complex surface or a complex surface. So J preserves the tangent space. OK? So um, yeah, we have that. Um, but in general, we want to look at more general, uh, of, um, a lot more than this. So in general, we want to look at maps u that go from sigma to r times y, where the sigma is a punctured Riemann, uh, punctured Riemann surface. So sigma is a closed Riemann surface. And then I remove some punctures, some points, that I'm going to call p1 plus to pk plus, and then q1 minus and ql minus. So I want to map from a Riemann surface maybe with genus. Uh, and I remove some points into my simplexization. And what I want to do is I want to I um, assume that at each puncture, I converge to a Rabe orbit. OK? So how do I say that? I'm going to try to say that quickly um, before we stop. So um, the first thing to notice is that if you look at a neighborhood of a puncture, this is biholomorphic to an infinite strip. So a neighborhood, um, well, d2 minus a puncture, minus a point, uh, with, I guess, any complex structure, is biholomorphic to s0 plus infinity times s1. So it's also biholomorphic to the, the minus infinity, s0 times s1. Okay, so what we want to require, let me just say this with words. So what we want to require is that for what we say are the positive punctures, that these guys are converging to, um, to these uh, cylinders, to these trivial cylinders, at, as s goes to plus infinity. And then at the, what we call the negative punctures, we want this, the, the u, to be converging to, ne to these cylinders at, uh, as s goes to minus infinity. Okay, so that's kind of what the picture says. 
Okay, so, well, um, let me just write it. So what we want is that uh, for positive puncture, so for pi plus, uh, if you look at u of s, and if, and if you look at a neighborhood of pi plus as s0 plus infinity into this guy, um, s0 times um, s1 into um, r times y. So if you look at u as this map, you want that um, when you look at the map u of um, sigma t, uh, you want the projection to the y of this as sigma goes to inf plus infinity to be um, gamma of t, where this guy is a ray orbit. And you want the r projection to go to plus infinity. the limit as sigma goes to <coughs> plus infinity, you want this to be plus infinity. Okay, So this is what a positive end is. And then you do the same thing for the negative ends. Okay? And by the way, the, this existing, you know, existing rave orbits like that, I think is equivalent to the curve having Hofer energy, finite Hofer energy, just like for other floor homologies. But I'm not going to get into that, because it's, it's, it's quite subtle. Okay. So um, the next thing to look at is, well, now we want to look at the moduli space of curves like that. So well, you say, you know, I have this j holomorphic curve, and it has these positive ends, and it has these negative ends at different uh, rave orbits. So I have, say I have rave orbits gamma 1 up to gamma k here, and then here I have rave orbits uh, ga ga gamma 1 plus, gamma k plus, and here I have rave orbits gamma 1 minus up to gamma L minus. So then, you know, the natural thing to do is to define the moduli space of J holomorphic curves that converge to gamma 1 plus up to gamma k plus, and then gamma 1 minus up to gamma L minus. Okay, so this is just, you know, basically what I described. This is a set of everything, all the <coughs> things I described with fixed ends. Okay? Uh, so the you know in in a good situation we would like to say that this is a manifold of dimension given by some formula. Okay, so if you compute the formula, you know this is um, like I was explaining a little bit. Um, that Gonzalo explained this, and I explained it a little bit on Wednesday afternoon. This is basically like the pre-image, uh, the intersection of the the image of some Fredholm operator with uh, some with a zero section of some bundle. And you know the expected dimension of this, there's a formula that you can compute from Riemann Rock. And I guess a little more analysis here that the curves are not compact. But so this, which is called the index of the curve, so there's a formula for this, which is uh, well, it's minus the Euler characteristic of sigma plus uh, first shortened class term, which I mean it's basically the first shortened class of C relative to tau applied to the homology class of U, uh, twice that. And then, so this is what you, get, you got for a closed holomorphic curve in dimension 4. And then there is something about what's happening at the ends. You have to look at the spectral flow, blah, 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 what ha what's happening at the ends. And no surprise, I think, at this point, if you came to the lectures on Tuesday, is that the Alexander index is going to appear as sort of the equivalent of the Morse index. So what you get here is now you get the sum of the Alexander indices of gamma i plus minus the sum of the Alexander indices of gamma i minus. Okay? So this is a number that you compute from, you know, algebraic geometry. Um, but the theorem, and um, I'm not, well, I guess, I guess this theorem is from transversality of curves, is that if uh, u is simple, meaning not multiply covered, or also known as somewhere injective, which sounds like a scarier word, so I'm going to use the word simple, um, then 
for generic J, uh, this moduli, this space, um, is a manifold near U of dimension given by this index. OK? So this is the space that we are going to look at. And if you have a curve that's multiple covered, then there are many, many, many problems. And that's why uh, Hofer, uh, Eli Ashberg, uh, given Tal Hofer's paper of 2000, which was supposed to be the symplectic field theory paper that would unify everything, is still not completely uh, understood or rigorously understood. But if you don't you know, care about multiply covered things, then this is a pretty nice theorem. This just uses the standard um, transversality arguments with a, a little bit more because it's a non-compact manifold. OK? So um, any questions? Huh? Why are these structures two dimensions? Well, actually, so far, I didn't, for, for this, you don't need three dimensions. Yeah. But the ne everything else I'm going to say is, is only for, I mean, ECH. So far, I haven't said anything about ECH. But yeah, so for this theorem, you can do it in any dimensions. Oh, OK. OK, maybe, maybe we, could, uh, we could flip it. Yeah, for, for generic J, for all simple U's, uh, this is a manifold near U. Yeah. Yeah, so you can actually choose a generic J that works for all simple U's. Yeah. OK, so let's stop here. Let's, let's have a 10-minute break. And then we'll come back with the definition of ECH. <laughs>